for questions one to three in this practice, I think you can just read the answers that I have written here. Make sure that you understand this and that you're comfortable finding critical values, inflection points, and understanding that a critical value could be a max, a min, or a shelf. Given that, I want to now start problem number four. All right, I have the answers to problem number four written out here for you, but let's go through some of the key points. In problem number four, I asked you to find the critical values and to find the critical points. Finding the critical values, you first take the first derivative. So here is your first derivative, and you're going to set that equal to zero, and you're going to carefully factor it out, and that gives you the critical values right here. These are just x values. Uh, in order to find the critical points, you're going to take these two x values and plug them way back up here in the original function. That gives me my critical points, which are listed right here. So you can do this using your calculator. You don't need to do it by hand. Now we're going to say uh, we're going to use a first derivative test, and we're going to classify each critical point as a min, a max, or a shelf, depending upon the outcome of the first derivative test. So, okay, we're going to do our first derivative test by setting up our sign chart. So here is our sign chart, and I'm going to square it in blue. So you put your critical values of negative 1 and 2 on your sign chart in the same order you would find on a number line. Now we're going to test to the left of negative 1. So let's pick a negative 2 and put that value into your first derivative and you're going to find that a negative 2 placed in place of the x's will give me a positive value for my slope. If my slope is positive, I indicate that by this plus. If my slope is positive, then my function is increasing, and that part of the sign chart is completed. Now, don't test your first derivative on a negative 1. We already know it's a 0 because that's how you selected your critical values. So move to the place on the line between negative 1 and 2, and let's pick a value of 0. So if I plug in a 0 in my first derivative, and where I'm plugging it in is right here and here, so negative times a positive is a negative times another positive is still a negative, so therefore my slope is negative. If my slope is negative, my function is decreasing. So I have another little segment of my sign chart filled in. Now let's go to the right of 2. Looking to the right of 2, let's select a 3. So I'm going to put a 3 in here and here. That's going to give me positive times a positive times a positive of 8. It remains a positive. If my slope is positive, my function is, decre is um, increasing. Excuse me, this should be up is increasing. If my function is increasing, that's another interesting point that I now have. That's going to allow me to do a quick sketch. Here is my quick sketch. Doing the quick sketch, I'm not putting in my actual points. I'm just having a sense of what my shape would look like given my slope is positive to the left and negative to the right. So I draw this shape. Then my slope is negative and it changes to positive. So as a side note, I know that someplace in here I am going to have an inflection point. So they asked me in the next piece about my inflection points. I know it has to be between negative 1 and 2 because that's where the slope changes and I notice also the concavity is changing there. So what I'm going to do for part C is, oh, let me backtrack for a second. At negative 1, I have a max. The critical point is right over here. And at 2, I have a min. And I've graphed it in part D, but let's go ahead and first talk about part C, which is the inflection point. 
To find your inflection point, you set your second derivative equal to zero and solve for the x. My x is equal to one half. So at one half, I have an inflection point. To figure out the y value, you take that one half and you plug it way back here in the original function and I get negative eight and two thirds. So I now have three points to plot. Really, I have four points because I know my y-intercept is going to be zero. So I plot my y-intercept, I plot my min, my max, and my inflection point, and I connect the dots. And you get the figure like you have in uh, letter D. And that takes care of number four. Turning now to number five, a very interesting thing happens. When I take my first derivative to see if I can find my min and my max by first identifying the critical values, I find that I cannot factor that. So I can then use the quadratic formula. Do not think that because you cannot factor it, you cannot solve it. You still can. You have the quadratic formula, and that's a formula you just should definitely be memorizing. In case you don't yet have that memorized, I've written it for you on top of this page in blue. Please write that down somewhere and commit it to memory. The assumption will always be that you just know that. All right, when I solve for my x, I find that I have a negative under the radical. A negative under the radical means that I have imaginary roots. Imaginary roots cannot be critical values. Therefore, there's no max, there's no min, and there's also no shelf. I can then go ahead and still answer part B, which talks about inflection points. Doing part B, I set my second derivative, which is 2x minus 8, equal to 0, and I solve for x, getting an x of 4. My inflection point, point meaning you have an x and a y value, is going to be 4, 3, 39 and 1 third. Again, I used a calculator to get that value. You can now sketch your graph, even though they didn't ask me to sketch it, it's always a good idea. So here is our graph over here to the right, and the graph starts at the y-intercept of 10, and I know my inflection point, so I can see that my function is concave down, from the starting point that I have here of 10 all the way to 4 but not inclusive and then from 4 to infinity. So that pretty much takes care of question 5. Here is the scenario where we couldn't find critical values because we had imaginary roots. So I'd like to talk about the graphing for 6 and 7 and we'll do that on the next slide. Okay, on the bottom of this slide, I see that um, question number six asked me to sketch the graph. So I have told you already that when I give you a question like that, I would like you to star the points. So the points are the function values um, at a particular x. So the points are the ones that I've starred, 0, 0, 8, 0, 5, 6, and 9, negative 5. Make sure that you are comfortable reading those points off of this list and that you recognize that they are points and you are able to identify both the x and the y component of those points. Once you have your points on your graph, then I would suggest that you start looking at your first derivatives. The first derivatives are going to give you slope information. So looking at my first derivatives, I have two pieces of information, both of which I have circled. So my f prime of 5 is 0. That tells me that it's a flat part of the graph, and it's either a max, min, or a shelf. So what I would suggest that you do when you begin to sketch these is that you indicate that you have these flat pieces by drawing a flat line at those two x values and you also have the y values so you're going to draw flat lines right there. So now continue gathering information. Look at your second derivatives. Those are indica indications of the concavity. So f prime prime of 7 um, 
being zero tells me that it's an inflection point. So I'm just going to write that point right here. That's an inflection point. The concavity is changing at that point. So that's interesting, but I need more information. So I have the information right here that f prime prime of 5, which is a flat point, is less than 0. If it's less than 0, it's concave down, and that's why I now can make the concave down shape at the point 5, 6. So if the inflection point is here, I must be changing to concave up. So let's continue to read my last piece of information, which is that the f prime prime of 8 is greater than 0. If it's greater than 0, it's concave up. So that means my function must have been changing to concave up somewhere after the inflection point, clearly. And I'm going to choose to continue in an up fashion after that minimum. So this is one possible graph. Remember what I said in class. The graphs that you give me may not all be identical, but as long as they satisfy these requirements, you are good to go. So let's go on to number seven. Looking at number seven, it says sketch the graph of a function that satisfies these requirements. So again, start with your points. I'm starring the points right here. I've put f0 equals 1. That's your y-intercept. That's right there. And f of 7 equals 0. That's a root of the function, and that's right there. Those are now taken care of. So f primes are next. So here I have an f prime, and then I have two more down here. Okay, looking through the f primes, I find that f prime of 4 is 0. Then that makes that a max, a min, or a shelf. So I'm going to indicate it just with a flat line right here. Now I'm going to look at f prime of 5. f prime of 5, which is to the right of the 4 that I know is a flat part, has a slope that's less than 0. So that's going to be going down. So that's interesting. I have that little piece of it. Then to the left, f prime of 2 is greater than 0. If that's greater than 0, then that's going to be positive, so it looks like I have a max right there. I'm also seeing that I have an inflection point at f prime prime of 3. So that means that my graph is changing concavity at 3. So I've indicated, and I think this is a little bit off in terms of where I've put things, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this should have been my inflection point right here. That's where things are changing. So just know that that's my inflection point. Here is my max. And I know really nothing else. So you can be as creative as you want with things. You know you have to include the points, and you have to include this other information. But what you do with the rest of the graph is kind of up to you as long as you satisfy these requirements. I'm going to make a second video on the remaining problems just so we have some more time to spend in the video.